morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to Free Thought Hour, which unusually this week is not live. Due to time zone considerations, our guest is in India, which is, as you know, several hours ahead. We couldn't stage this show at the normal time, so we're recording it earlier in the day to be shown at the proper time later. And also, our guest is, for personal security reasons, he's in the closet. He's anonymous. So I can only show his icon and we can listen to his voice. But welcome, Rakshith. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hello. So, How yeah, are yeah. you? I'm good. I'm good. And uh, thanks for having me as a guest. And it's a great privilege. I would like to have a good talk and I hope uh, people will be listening to our chat and hopefully they will get some insights into religion and the society. Well, yeah. thank you for coming. because And we do yeah. get a, a decent audience. It is worth doing these shows nowadays. We've built up to a considerable number in, in the three figures usually. So it's, it's, well, it's well worth having these chats and putting them out. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah thanks. Uh, uh, and uh, one more I would like to mention. So ex Hindu Atheist is, uh, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, one can check it out where we do lots of debates, discussions on the religion and society in general. But uh, yeah, I think this is just a brief introduction and about uh, ex Hindu Atheist's uh, YouTube channel in general. So well, one can do you, check it out. Yeah. If you can give us the details of your channel, your ex yeah, yeah, sure, sure. channel. We'll get um, we'll get Swedish Steve, who is producing this behind the scenes, to make a banner to, to put tickering along the bottom to advertise you. Okay, right. So, Ragshith, we've known each other now for a couple of years in various roles, and uh, yeah, I'm pleased yeah. about I'm pleased to have your friendship. But uh, what I want you to do today, for the benefit of our audience. Because yeah. I suspect that m most of my audience is in the West, you know, and if it's anything yeah. like the UK, when the general public are not very well educated about Hinduism, we do have some Hindu communities because, of course, as you know, we're a cosmopolitan nation and we do have some Hindu temples where Hindu worship goes on. But the majority of the general public is pretty ignorant about what Hinduism is, about what the gods mean, and, and so on and so forth. So at some stage in this conversation, I'd like you to educate us. Should we start with that? And, and then perhaps you can tell us a bit about your personal journey, how you... Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So can you give us some, a potted idea of, of what Hinduism is? Because it's very different from Christianity and from Islam, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think compared to other, uh, so one you can look at it this way. One is a southwest religion versus something which is east of Iran. I think uh, best one of one of my way of looking at religion is you classify religions west of Iran and east of Iran. Uh -huh. That's the best way I look at it. Yes. So anything east of Iran, God is not significant. Creator God is not important. Yes. But anything west of Iran, Creator God is very, very important yes. with a prophet. That's, That's what you need to keep in mind. And Zoroastrianism, I like, keep it as a reference that it has a little bit of this Hinduism and that thing and a little yes. bit of uh, Abrahamic, both sides. So, yes. so one of the best means of understanding world religion is west of Iran and east of Iran. That's the way to go. I'll keep that in mind. Interesting. Yeah. So the more eastern you go, if you go further east to India, further east, go to China, Japan, mm -hmm. God becomes nothing more than a life energy. Something like Taoism has, or Confucianism has, or something yes. like Deism has. All right. Very sort of vague. I mean, it becomes insignificant there. It's virtually, you can say, morality, ethics, but not so much about religion. So mm -hmm. that itself packs as that. But hindsight, a lot of rituals. The more east you go, the more rituals. Yes, yes. So there what is increase in the rituals. Yeah. 
rituals help to bind people together, don't they? As a communal experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. So one thing you can keep in mind: the more rituals, the it's more of a potent way to put an idea into said. I mean, you have ideas like reincarnation. You may have ideas like karma. You have ideas like uh, uh, soul, uh, some eternal entity which is there beyond the body. All that thing will be there, but then how to reinforce it? So one of the powerful means of reinforcing it is through rituals. Mm. you conduct rituals you do uh, worship in temples you bring statues mm-hmm. you bring many other things items and build on that uh, and one it, of the it, great uh, thinkers uh, in yeah i was going to say it can include diet too can't it and, yeah, yeah 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 and that's that's true that's true and taboos things you mustn't do that's true that's true uh, i think uh, one area where i think all religions are united is taboo i mean every religion has a taboo but uh, again when you come back to eastern religion especially like hinduism or even buddhism for that matter the best way to emphasize that idea is through ritual i mean uh, monks especially if you have seen buddhist monks when they eat they need to chant something hindus especially if it is a brahmin when he is eating he is also supposed to chant certain uh, prayers certain mantras and then he must eat so again these are kind of ways to sort of uh, uh, you know uh, kind of program the ideology into your mind ideas of reincarnation ideas of uh, uh, you know eternal entity called as atman or jiva as we say so like that this is one one of the ways it's done and i think uh, one good observation while reading through i am actually a great fan of yuval noah harari <laughs> i like his books uh, i think he writes uh, great content of the who sorry yuval noah harari a uh, israeli historian oh right yes okay yeah yeah the uh, you know best seller sapiens mm-hmm. so actually i uh, even have been looking at and i think he has also made one point that uh, china was able to maintain feudal system for a long long time because of confucian idea of rituals so it's the rituals that keeps the feudal ideas that keeps getting these things so coming back to uh, i would actually start with my personal journey and then i'll give a deeper uh, understanding of hinduism or what i have got to know yeah yeah Go so ahead. so my personal journey is like uh, i am actually born in a decently orthodox family i wouldn't say totally orthodox but decently enough orthodox family uh-huh. mm-hmm. and uh, we uh, you know there is three sects within hinduism one is shaivite vaishnavite and uh, shakta so we belong to vaishnavite sect which worships vishnu or krishna as a supreme god so that's one thing uh, but one of the things uh, during my childhood was my mother used to tell lot of stories and i liked hearing that and in fact uh, when i was child i actually thought uh, whatever the characters is there in that story is real they must be existing yes. if i pray to them or if i do bhakti i do loving devotion and loving service to them yes. i love them by heart they will come back to me they will help me that that sort my whole thought was and if anything good happened at that stage anything just good happened today of course i realize that it may be coincidence but anything good happened i used to think oh it's because of that yeah i uh, mean that, that it's because of that god i was uh, loving them so yeah, yeah it must be a good experience that's what yeah, so my childhood you, was yeah, so you attributed good things to your relationship with this god that you prayed for at, at your mother's knee yeah i mean my mother and i used uh, my mother always used to take me to worship and i used to help her out uh, yes. i had great devotion for like uh, towards ram and vishnu especially vishnu this thing vishnu the god okay so that was my sort of uh, uh, kind of fascination but it's not that i was just limited to it i mean there were times when i also looked up to the goddess aspect of the hinduism where we worship uh, goddesses and i used to watch serial in india believe it or not there are serials made on gods there are plenty of serials to go out there so i used to watch and get fascinated i used to get oh my god this must be something divine i used to get goosebumps <laughs> really so this is on tv is it or in in the movie cinema 
टीवी 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 सीरियल्स आर द शोस यही है सो इन इंडिया वी हैव प्लेंटी ऑफ दैट टू बी ऑनेस्ट यस आई नो दिस सो इट वाज ग्रेट मूवी इंडस्ट्री इन इन इंडिया इट्स या मूवी इंडस्ट्री इज देयर बट अपार्ट फ्रॉम मूवी इंडस्ट्री यू हैव television industry television. yes yes so which produces great number of serial series and television yeah. shows we call mythological it... genre television shows you would, call... you have i don't know how much but it's great it's great numbers big number yes it's big big industry we call it bollywood from here <laughs> yeah uh, but apart from bollywood i think there are others there is something like tollywood kollywood based yes. on the local languages Yes yes uh, but let me continue my journey further uh, so back in 2013 i was like uh, yeah i mean i was very devout and worshiping but at the same time i thought i need to start giving reading i liked vivekananda uh, swami vivekananda you know you know the hindu reformer of 19th century so i liked his ideas as well oh he must be great so i started reading about him i started searching then there is uh, books written by prabhupad the iskon founder so especially i think the krishna book i think i read it twice thrice at that time i looked who oh, krishna is so great he can protect he, if i am devoted serving to them if i love krishna as i love radha as la radha and uh, his uh, girlfriends did probably i will achieve the salvation probably i will I have everything in my life that that that's was a sort of thinking at that time uh-huh so can I, uh, can I interrupt you there a minute because you've you've talked about krishna who seems to be from my position a good god who does nice things for you if you're if you worship him but do you have any sort of satanic nasty gods in your pantheon uh if you look at satanic i think it's mixed i mean it's more based on the perception that uh if you look at it closely if you look at all the hindu scriptures closely on mm. a very close look a gods come to help if they want to benefit the upper castes rather than the others okay i mean mm. others are there they can take but the highest benefits will be given to say people who are say more devoted to them or at the say people who admire uh, who take uh, to take the position that yes we accept the superiority of upper castes mm-hmm. so only on those situation they give very benefits but otherwise if you really want to know what is satanic in that then there is there is one scripture i think that is garud puran so garud mm-hmm. puran mentions about heaven and hell both so there are certain things if you do it didn't go according to the scriptures if it go according to the so, uh, the norms set by gods you would go to hell okay uh-huh. so and the there reason, are the, yeah. the reason why i wanted to in, to ask about that is because you have this symbol the swastika the bent cross which of yeah, course yeah, yeah. was adopted you've had it for i don't know thousands of years but it was adopted by the nazis in germany for world mm. war 2 and it got a very bad reputation that's not what it that's means true. originally is it i think most hindus most hindus uh, if you ask uh, they are just they will tell you that it means symbol of auspiciousness that's um, what they would tell you mm-hmm. i mean uh, they would put it in front of the door or in front of the window as yes symbol of auspiciousness ah. but to be honest my own research suggests that you there is no one way to decipher this there is no no under clear cut understanding what why it was used even in the ancient times yeah see one of the symbol which you see in the indus seal indus sole civilization is this swastika but nobody knows why were they using it of course today we say it is auspicious we are saying this today in recent past but are we sure that did it have the same meaning back then we don't know there is no like kind of uh, uh, sure guarantee but one of the things i have observed is uh, we do sort of redactions we do lot of redactions i mean mm-hmm. attributing the present things to the past we do a lot of that in these days well i wonder how, i wonder why hitler adopted it for the nazis maybe cuz auspicious means sort of uh, future future success 
it means you know success is likely in the maybe future. maybe yeah it could be but That's actually good. one of the things i my research so one of the things where i have been come to know is here i was actually more fascinated by the writings of uh, the theosophical society uh, madam blavatsky mm -hmm. uh, who wrote about the aryans and coming future races something like that hitler seems to have been very much fascinated with that i mean which could have been one reason why he adopted that maybe without even yeah so we've we've gone to the stage in your personal life story you can tell us more about the various gods in a minute because as you said they're symbolic of, of various um what was the word you used uh, uh no no i that was the word i used for swastik but the gods in general though i mean it is a latest in interpretation that it's symbolic but uh, when it comes to practicing right it doesn't look symbolic it almost looks like yes they really exist oh right okay right so we got to the stage where you delved into hinduism quite deeply you've been reading about it and so on so why are you now an ex hindu what happened <laughs> <laughs> okay this is interesting uh, i actually in i mean there are a lot of sects so i was looking at each one of them so uh, i started actually with ram krishna mission the thing of uh, vivekananda i started reading it was all kind of great but then i did observe there were contradictions even within the speeches of vivekananda i mean he would say one thing here but he wouldn't stand with the same point somewhere else he would change his stance so i observed i did observe but then i thought yeah, i mean still what happens he was a great man that's why as you as every hindu thinks so but then i was also reading started reading about uh, dayanand saraswati another 18th century uh, not 18th century sorry 19th century reformer hindu reformer uh, he started the sarya samaj so you know there were many youtube channels already i mean if you look at indian youtube channel there are plenty of hindu youtube channels mm. and of course many of them have more to do with the hate mongering than with the religion which i realized later but yeah yes. so i started looking at all of that and then i started reading about uh, dayanand saraswati his works in satyarth prakash that book uh, one of the reason which i think uh, i uh, one of the reason is his opinion on vaishnavism and about worship of krishna and all i think that that really hurt me and that was one reason why i rejected that uh, position of dhanan sarsati because he was of the opinion it's sheer stupidity and nonsense oh. i mean his uh, take on vaishnavism was very 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 critical which i didn't like at that time <laughs> so that was one reason for my rejection of arya samaj and you know this uh, uh, dhanan saraswati at that stage but uh, i still continued and you, you know i used to even while going to office or going to anywhere any places i used to keep chanting the god's name like uh, that yes. hare krishna hare rama <laughs> uh -huh. yes. i used to do that as well yeah yes. uh, i used to i even read the bhagavad gita of uh, prabhupad then yes. there was also stages when i also tried doing little bit of vedant what uh, ram krishna mission said advait vedant so little well, bit of that i the, tried all that but at the end of the day then i started then i started to discover one thing you know what is all that i mean let's start exploring religion and i started reading about buddhism as well uh, right of, so you began to since you found some contradictions which sort of poked holes in the hindu uh, religion that you've been brought Not, up yeah yeah you've started to wonder about other religions but one of the things that i encounter in my internet activities is uh, people claiming that um, for christianity for example has a long tradition it's maybe 2000 years old based in A, a Jewish religion that's even older, you know, goes back maybe three or four thousand years, and um, they they think that gives their belief system some substantiation. They think you know it's been around a long time; it must be good. Of course, there's no logical reasoning to that. But the Bhagavad Gita, Gita that you mentioned, that goes back even further, doesn't it? When were those books written? 
Oh man, actually, as I said, it's a reduction. Books are written mostly after in last two thousand years at the best. Most of the written work, okay. Maybe some were older than that. Maybe older than Buddha. Maybe as far as knowledge goes, uh, Vedas seem to, as many scholars suggest, Vedas seem to be older than the Buddha, Buddha and Mahavir time. But uh, the things like Puranas, Upanishads, and even Mahabharat, they are written after I think Ashokan period, the Ashoka and Mauryan Empire, post Mauryan period, they are written. So, and even if you look at uh, last thousand year. i think most of the puranas though there are said to be 108 puranas but i think out of 108 at least 70 to 80% of the puranas were written only in the last say 1000 years period oh, only in the last 2000 years <laughs> yes in the last 1000 year along with uh, some of the new upanishads yes and yes. even if you talk about upanishad i think only two or three are very old which is contemporary around the time of buddha yeah I think uh, two are there. I think Brihadranik, Chandogya. These are Upanishads which are contemporary to kind of Buddha. But most other uh, Upanishads are post-Buddhist period, post-Buddha. So that's one thing. So you know, I started uh, reading about you know a little bit about Buddhism, but then I felt like uh, okay, but is there any other thing? Because we know one thing for sure: Buddhism has two big sects. One is Hinayan, that is Theravada, which you see in Sri Lanka, and then there is Mahayan, which you see in Japan, China, and Korea. Mm-hmm. So I started to get into Mahayan, and I started mm-hmm. reading some of the. Now, one of the fascinating things what I found was the intellectual of Mahayan were far more superior to intellectuals of Hinduism. Yeah. That's one of the things which I found. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. that's my honest observation here. because mm-hmm. when i read uh, the writings of uh, the mahayan uh, people who were debating i think with the brahmins of that time mm. if you read their their intellectual ability was far superior to what i perceived as uh, vedanta far superior mm. to those of to, uh, today sindhus hinduisms and uh, vedas All vedanta right. actually interesting Now there's a couple of other things I want to introduce into this conversation in a minute, um, because uh, w- what we see over here is interesting, very colourful images of um, Hindu gods, including Ganesh, the one with the elephant head, and yeah. I don't know how m- I don't know how many arms. But c- can you tell me what's the significance of those particular gods, gods like that? Uh. i think you can comp- you know every i think if you look at the ancient world for example you look at the greek gods you look at egyptian yes. gods you look yes. at uh, mesopotamian yes. god they always have one thing in common part human part animal part human yes. part animal you know anubis yes. the egyptian god it has yes. a yes. fox head but a part yes. human part yes. yeah Yes, the Egyptians had Anubis, a dog-headed god, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, and they also had Thoth, and I think there are many other gods, Horus. Yes. Yes. Bird-headed. So you know, part human, part. Yes. I think uh, one of the common things uh, you find is if you look at the Hindu pantheon of gods, there are a lot of part human and part animal. Yes. Yes. A lot yes. of that. Yeah, well, and uh, Ganesh belongs one of them. Uh, I, have... I think uh, though. Uh, i would la- rather look at it from historical perspective rather than any uh, symbolic uh-huh. what it actually means okay. because yep. for me what suggests that is there is a transition from tribal society to agriculture society yes yes and that's I what have, it suggests i have a theory about this too because i think that uh, along with the transition from tribal lots of tribes uh, when when humanity was um, hunting and gathering and there were lots of small tribes that had their own they didn't need to have residences because of course they were following animals across the, the plains or whatever so uh, but then agriculture was invented and at that yeah. point at that point you needed to build a home so that you could be near yeah. your crop to guard it so and, that became your private property Yes, that's right. That was the beginning of ownership of land. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and so at that time, there were because there were still lots of tribes, but all settled in their own various pockets of the planet. 
mostly in the what we now call the Middle East. At that time, there were lots of gods, and many of them had a natural uh, resemblance as well. They were half animal or even half tree <laughs> and half human. And so pantheism had lots of gods, each with a specific capability. So, uh, for example, yeah. if, if you look at um, one of my favorites is the Greek god Cloacina. Um, actually, she was a Roman god, I beg your pardon, probably because the, the Romans picked up on the, the Greek pantheon, didn't they, and, and converted Yeah, they them. did pick up many of them, yeah. Yes, and, and Cloacina's function was to keep the sewers of Rome flowing. <laughs> so, yeah. So, <laughs> So she she was like um, what do we call them nowadays? Uh, renter, we we got a, a company here that goes about and unblocks your sewer if you want if you want that done. And so she, that was her function, her purpose. You worshipped her in order to keep the sewers flowing. So my theory goes on to say that instead of it wasn't a very good business having lots of gods because they could only perform one function. So if you were a priest of a particular god, then you could only get money from their followers at particular times of need. You know, if it was some god who helped to deliver you a, a bountiful crop, then you had to wait until August, maybe, in order to get your followers to donate to you. If it was a god that, um, I don't know, kept away disease, then that, that was particularly necessary in maybe the winter. So, But then people realized that it was a better idea to have one god who could do everything. And monotheism was invented. And of course, once, you, once you've got a, a monotheistic, all-powerful, omnipotent god, you're onto a good earner. <laughs> you know, he, he can do anything, so he's needed yeah. all the time, and you and you can you can fleece the worshippers any day of the year. That's my personal theory. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, but you know, in India, right? Until I think uh, about eighth or ninth century of Adi Shankaracharya, there was yes. nothing of the resemblance to any monotheistic idea or even monism, for that matter. It all yes. started from Adi Shankaracharya. He talked about Advaita, means the one not one without the two. There is no two things. There is no duality. There is only monistic. I mean, uh, you are the God, you are the one. I mean, uh, his emphasis was that we there is a jiva in all of us. Hindu concept uh, that uh, there is a soul, eternal soul or Atman, as they like to put it. Of course, my own, after studying recently, I uh, convinced that there is no soul eternal soul as such it's ultimately how our body and uh, society works that's what matters but again, right. again coming back to uh, the idea of jiva the eternal soul the idea is that it has a human body through human body it performs work through that work you live a life and whatever life you are leading now is because you had uh, done some good or bad in your previous life so what you do now will ensure that you do good or bad, you will get in the future life. Uh -huh. So right. that soul goes, leaves the body, it goes to either heaven or hell based on what it did in this life. After getting punishment and uh, gifts in uh, heaven or hell, it again comes back to earth and takes a new birth. And mind you, you have to go through 84 lakh species. 84 wow. lakh species to finally get a human body. Wow. So, I mean, this looks like a kind of, when I read initially, right, it, to me, it suggests kind of uh, mental slavery of a society. Yes. yes. It's kind of like that. I mean, you are actually giving greed as well after the death, but at the same time, you're showing fear that if you don't obey the yes. current society now, Yes. You will have this, you have to go through this process. And it's yes. a long process. Would you mind doing that? So, you know, it's a psychological that thing, actually. Yes. I observe that way. Yes, it's a sort of gaslighting, isn't it? You've got a hidden threat over you. If you don't, uh, if you don't behave in this life, you, you won't have the benefits of 
all these different afterlives. Now, I wanted to talk to you about that too, because um, uh, I wasn't sure, first of all, of, about the Hindu afterlife, because it is quite different from monotheistic yeah. afterlives, where, where, where you are in a heaven or a hell, presumably, and, and you don't come back, as it were. You're, you've then ascended and you've achieved, and that's it. You don't really, you don't want to come yeah. back because you're yeah. in a better place. Now, yeah. the, the Hindu version doesn't seem to be like that. It seems to be, let's get back here. You know, let's be reincarnated. And, come and back that, uh, you, uh, even uh, you end up seeing the same pattern in Buddhism and Jainism and Sikhism. Yeah. Yes. So all the religion which originated had a common idea. Yes. So this thing seems to exist, actually. Chinese religion don't have reincarnation, but they have something else you know, for it. Like, uh, I mean, their idea is like... Uh, representation of energy or representation of God mm. and the kings like that. So it's less slightly different, but yeah, they have something else. Uh -huh. But if you look at uh, Hinduism, for example, uh, one thing is there, the idea of caste. Now, of yes. course, they say, oh, <laughs> yes. again, uh, I mean, uh, English word for water is water. But in our language, we say as padding, we say as ye uh, jal uh, like that in our local languages. So right. does that mean water is different from Jal versus Pani? Is it different? No. No. So you can put caste as like this. Uh, I think it has uh, things to do with uh, the migrations. Migrations from Central Asia, migration from Iran. I actually look at migrations from Iran more closely. Uh, so yeah. when you have people migrating, I think what happened is uh, more probably the how society was divided was there is a priestly class called Brahmins who are supposed to be very good, who are supposed to be great, who are supposed to be honorable, truthful, non-violent, yes. all knowledgeable. Yes. They should have all scriptural knowledge. They should have all the ability to do all ceremonies. That yes. was Brahmins. Yes, yes. Then you have That's another the, sect. They're the top caste. Yeah, they're topmost. Yes. I mean, they... they yeah. Back, back in the day, of course, we had something similar here. We had a class system, which was you know, hierarchy with the king and the royalty at the top. Then there was the nobility, the lords and, and ladies and so on. And then there was uh, what you call, like, call a merchant class. And then there was the serf class who didn't own anything and just had to yeah, work Who were just servants. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so we then... had... Mm -hmm. Carry on. So let me continue. Then we had a group of warrior class, warriors mm. who could fight, who could uh, run a kingdom, who could be kings, who could hold state power, uh, essentially state power. So they were called as Kshatriyas and they could uh, win battle, they could marry anyone, they could even kidnap uh, women mm. and marry them from the opposing mm. kingdoms if it required. So mm. they could do that. They had that permission. Then yeah. below them came the Merchant class, people who could go outside and trade, who could do farming, who could do earning, who was yeah. more of a middleman, uh -huh. middleman jobs of trades, so trade you had and a... uh, monetary this thing, banking, all that. Yes, so they were the commercial layer, and you had this warrior. Layer, yeah. They had this warrior class, which had a sort of wild card. They could do yeah. anything, and then at the bottom you have the people who really have to. Subservient, yes. Yeah. So, so subservient people, uh, you know, uh, they would do all the jobs, serving jobs, in the sense like they would build the houses, they would build uh, statues, they would build, you know, temples. Yes. They would they even would... Uh, do like a uh, job of agriculture, uh, help for, uh, uh, you mm. know, farmers, okay? Yes. Make instruments, make, yes. uh, you know, uh, what to say, uh, uh, like uh, make swords, or yes. weapons for the king, all these type of jobs. They were the but wallet. this was considered very menial at the time, even though they were still contributing. <laughs> Are they the wallers? Does waller mean worker? What, what, what? Waller, the word waller. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know actually, you know? we call oh. that shudras, people who do all the jobs, shudras. All right. Interesting. And the merchant class were trading and banking group of people were Vaishyas. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Okay. And, so, and these these castes were delineated by all sorts of things, weren't they? By dress, by by what food they ate, and even by the status of uh, staff. I mean, what type of staff they will carry? Mm. Brahmins yes. should carry certain long staff. Yes. Kshatriya is supposed to carry this, and Vaishyas are supposed to do that. Yes. Did that extend to their funerals? I mean, I, it's interesting to me so, uh, yeah. the, the different ways of disposing of a body in, in India compared to the Western world. And yeah. quite, quite often I understand that the, the body is not exactly cremated, but burnt on, on a pile of stones. Is that something that's related pile of to woods. The pile of woods. Yes. And sometimes, sometimes it's left for the vultures. Is, are yeah. these things related to religions? Yeah, yeah, they, they are, they are. I mean, uh, e generally speaking, the Hindu scriptures prescribes, uh, you know, what you say as cremation, generally mm. speaking. Uh, if you look at uh, Ramayana or Mahabharata for that matter, it's cremation, generally mm -hmm. speaking. Vedas do not necessarily speak much on it. Vedas are kind of silent on it, not much. Uh -huh. But if you look at Puranas and Marama and Mahabharata, it's cremation. I mean, body is supposed to be burnt on a pile of wow. wood. Right. Yeah. Yes. So let me continue about uh, further about caste system. Actually, the you know, whole central idea of Hinduism is Varnashram. If Varnashram exists, Hinduism exists. If no Varnashram, no spirituality, no this thing. That's the whole center, actually. Mm. So let me continue further. So you Shudras used to do all the jobs. They used to make things. They used to do gardening. They used to do like a distribution of things for like people who used to carry stones, carry bags, carry mm -hmm. things for the kings and you know this sort of things. Yes, yes. So servant class. Yes. Below them, below them, people who actually cleaned the sewers were made untouchables. Right. The untouchables, yes. Yeah, the untouchable, we say, in there is a Sanskrit word for it. We call them as Ati Shudras or Antyajas. I mean, who uh -huh. are not even servants. Right. Not, not either related to a Brahmin, Kshatriya or Vaishya, who even through servant part. Be so they are classified human. as Antyaj. Barely human. Yeah, I mean, that? the, that's the kind of society was, actually. Yes, um, yes. So, at least with the Shudras, though they may not have the rights as much as, say, Brahmin or Kshatriya or Vaishya at prime, but there was one thing common. They could live as a servant of, you know, these three, uh, top three castes, that is Brahmin, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas. So they could be servant to them, okay, and in the return, they could get food, they could get clothing and a little bit of good uh, house in return. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what uh, their reward was, but not right. they couldn't, but they were not allowed to start any independent business of their own. Yes, yes, independent right. business so, of their own. Okay, okay. So, Whereas so, people who were not even related to any of these things, right? Yes, they were made as you know the untouchable, but we call it in Sanskrit as Ati Shudras or Antyajas. It's okay. a very complicated society that you used to have. Uh, and is it becoming yeah. more modern? I, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I'm aware that since uh, Narendra Modi became your prime minister, there's been an yeah. uprising of nationalism. And, and yeah. we, from here, we see people wearing the saffron color in, the, in, yeah, their, yeah. in their dress and their scarves and things. And they, mm -hmm. they do seem to be quite, um, quite aggressive. What can you say about that? Is that that's true? That's true. And I think, uh, uh, to be honest, I would say India's media has a big role to play in this. I would rather blame it on the Indian media and the yes. social media. I think yes. it has played a very big part in the propagation of uh, uh, the Hindutva bigotry. To be honest, yes, uh, Hindutva. That's that's the name for this group of uh, yeah, fundamentalist. Yeah. Aggressive Hindus, yeah, Hindutva bigotry. So Big that's Hindu. Hindu. Yeah. yes. Hmm. So you know, uh, for Islam is only a means for hating Muslim. They don't have much to do with Islam. Okay, yes. they don't even blame it. But in fact, uh, one of the reason 
uh, it has a lot of caste connotation as well. Why? Because one thing is clear: most Muslims who converted in subcontinent, okay, most of them were from the lower castes who actually converted to Islam or were made to convert into Islam. I would rather put it that way: forced to convert it to Islam. So most of them were lower castes. So you know what? Uh, this is a, I would rather call it as a neo casteism. Oh. I mean, in a very new mm. way. Yes. Actually, well, they are doing it. That that's interesting because the Islam and, and Christianity seem to me to be much more proselytizing. Proselytizing, they want, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they want to convert people to their religion much more than. The Hindus do. Is that is that a correct view? Or that's true. That's that? to an extent I agree. That's true. Of course, mm -hmm. these days Hindus have started fashioning themselves more in that line. But uh, mm -hmm. if you look at uh, Hinduism in general, there is no concept of proselytization. Uh, it's not that anybody can tell. The only Indian religion which has anything to do with proselytization is Buddhism. Yeah. Apart from Buddhism, there is no other uh, suggestion that shows. To be proselytization because mm. uh, we know Buddhists went out of India, they went to parts of Asia, and yes. they did uh, have a lot of adherents there. But yes. uh, that's not the case, say, with uh, the Hindu uh, religion or Jainism, even Jainism and uh, Sikhism for that matter, mm -hmm. though they originated here, but they don't have proselytizing concept here. Yeah. Hindus, Hinduism also doesn't have. But today they are actually trying to do, I think, as a part of competition or, I mean, yeah. superiority complex, but they're trying that these days. Yes, yes. Well, I, I don't really want to get into the division of India when, when, the, when the British Raj gave independence to the subcontinent, <laughs> yeah, yeah. because that was a terrible time. Wasn't it? There was, oh, I, yeah, the, I have to agree. That's true. There was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the, the division, partition of India was, I think, Yes. A very sad moment in world yes. history, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Rumor has it about a million people were killed, and as they tried to separate, to go over the border that was created to form uh, part, what is now Pakistan. In fact, a lot of riots happened. Hindu-Muslim riots. I yes. mean, there is no count of it actually. Yes, that was a terrible time. And then more recently, when the what was previously East Pakistan converted into Bangladesh, that was another. Horrendous uh, 1971, of... that was. Yes, yes, yes. But what I do want to talk to you about is what you now do as an ex-Hindu, as an atheist. Now, you're active, obviously, because you're here on my show. But uh, yeah, so, yeah. What is, uh, what so is... I'll continue further my journey. Uh, so, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, then I started reading about Buddhism as well, and I understood to an extent where I found the superiority. But then I also saw there are common things. Uh, actually, you can look at it this way. Mm -hmm. uh, Islam right. has five pillars, right? Mm -hmm. You can put yes. it essentially Indic religions, so religion of India, right? Pre-Islamic religions of India. You can put it uh, having five basic things. One is karma, reincarnation, eternal entity which survives after death, but how nobody says, but it survives after death, eternal entity. And fourth and foremost is Varna Ashram, Varna plus Ashram, that is caste system, yes. along with the lifestyle you are supposed to follow. Yes. So right. these are the essential things, I think, which is common among all the religions in India. Mm -hmm. And fourth, fifth and for, for, for a fifth point I would add, that is patriarchy and rituals, two things. You can add it under fifth point, patriarchy and rituals. Yes. Patriarchy. So these are the five things which you which is common across religions in India. Yes. The foundation yes. of Hinduism is this. It has patriarchy, it has karmic theory, it yes. has reincarnation and punarjanam theory, it has yes. an idea of eternal entity which survives after that, goes to heaven, hell, and comes back. And Fifth, Varnashram. Varnashram in the sense uh, you are supposed to do your duties, what is prescribed yes. by the castes, Duty. where you are born yes, in. Yes. yes. So can, can I uh, test me out on this? Because I'm of the impression that 
Hinduism is a more tolerant sort of religion than many, many of particularly of the, the monotheistic religions, which they, they tend to have hatred of, of people who are not like them. Um, and yeah. and to, to such an extent that, you know, they can commit atrocities because a person is gay, for example. And uh, but it, it does. It seems to me that Hinduism is more embracing. It's more um, willing to accept different different sorts of individuals. Is that is that a false impression or is that correct? I think this is. I won't say completely correct impression because it has a lot of falsity in that. But one thing is clear: the reason why you see a lot of tolerant suspect is because. Hinduism had to evolve in order to outcompete Buddhism and Jainism. Mm. And in fact, uh, the concept of uh, embrace and tolerance comes from the word called as uh, Anekantvad of Jainism, which means uh, many sided views. So mm -hmm. Hinduism had to take this view inside, it had to appropriate in order to survive. Otherwise, it wouldn't have stood against Jainism or Buddhism. Mm. So if you look at uh, Buddha, Pre-Buddha time, you had Brahmins, as I said, with this uh, set of caste system and people who were neither servants of the top three castes mm -hmm. or neither of the th top three castes were classified as, you know, Atishudras or Antyaj and they mm -hmm. did all the menial jobs. They would take yes. care of the dead bodies or they would take care of the sewages or they would take care of all the dirt on the road or something like that. Okay, yes, that's what yes. they But post-Buddha, here is interesting. Emphasis changed in different direction. There was a lot of skepticism going around, oh. especially of this system. Jainism started with that as well. So then there was also something called as Charvakans, people who were non-Vedic atheists. Okay, non-Vedic atheists completely. You can compare him, them with Epicureans in many ways. So they completely denied the afterlife existence and even denied the Varna and Ashram system. Now, if you look at the word Varna, Varna means, has many meanings, but one of the meanings, it also has color. Apart from the fact that, uh, you know, profession title. So it also means color. It also means status. So it has many meanings to it, the word Varna in mm -hmm. Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the word Ashram, Ashram is the stages of a man's life. So if you look closely stages, there is one called as Brahmacharya, celibacy. I think celibacy is one thing which is also there in Christianity as well. They emphasize it in different ways. Catholics, I guess. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, Grihastha, means household life. Then you have Vanaprast. I mean, you become, you leave the house and you are a wanderer. Okay. Then last part is Sanyas, complete ascetic. Asceticism. Uh -huh. So, of the three, of the uh, of the four of the ashrams, the stages of life, three stages of life, you are virtually begging uh, to get food, begging from others. It's only in the grihastha that you follow the duty of varna, actually. So that is one thing which is uh, to be noted. So this is the system here, but all the system can be justified because. Uh, you're, you, If you ask why you are born in such a varna, if you ask why you are having this varna, they will justify that it is your karma. When karma? Uh, it is your previous life's job, which has made you as a shudra or a brahmin or a kshatriya or a vaisha in this uh, life. And though it's known that there is no afterlife, but uh, some of the society needs to maintain that you uh, so that the lower caste people don't rebel against them you tell them you do this good job in this life next life you can become a brahmin or you can become a kshatriya so that is why karmic theory is there and reincarnation is there and the only way reincarnation can happen is through some eternal entity coming outside the body and surviving so right. that's what they call it as jiva or atman for that matter right so can I just check this banner that we yeah, put yeah, this up? This is the channel. This is the channel. That will get you get people to your YouTube channel. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So after studying all that, then I started reading about uh, Bhagat Singh's writing. Uh, why mm -hmm. I'm an atheist. Uh, jail diary. 
mm-hmm. when british had put him in the jail and they tried him un, you know unlawfully or unfairly to be honest at that time so um, i read through his jail diary writings and uh, why i am in it is then i also read work of jyoti bafule called gulamgiri or slavery i mean it's more about uh, this uh, system caste system how it's imposed how this varnashram works all that so i read that book and that actually changed my perspective completely and i uh, had my friend actually he is uh, he struggles little bit with english so my friend is there and uh, you know we started with this youtube channel exindutists right and started yeah so do you do anything else other than your youtube channel is it uh, i mean are you active in any other way or is it too dangerous because i know that you've been yeah. <laughs> you're in a position where you might be getting threats uh, to your safety that this is why you're not showing your camera face yeah and uh, you know another reason is we are also very critical of islam Mm-hmm. i mean we also criticize islam in our channel uh, any anybody any atheist from any religious background who has left his religion or belief system is welcome in our channel as well so they right. do keep their honest opinions and yes. uh, you know we you 2020 i remember uh, 2020 was also very in a terms of backwaters for me in terms of watershed moment what you like to call yes where my perspective changed everything after how reaction to hindu goddess uh, sexy kali photo happened the thermal oh, nawabi yes. yes yes that the... actually more sort of accelerated uh, towards this thing actually right so before that, that was... i was uh, though i was reading but i was also like okay let's see how it is maybe it will improve progress but then the way the hindus and the people reacted to that mm. sexy image kali of uh, yeah. armin nawabi Kali. Yeah, sexy Kali. I was like, I was like, oh my God! I mean, uh, if if any belief system can make you to go such an extent for a yes. photo yes. on an online threat, you. I yeah. mean, we know that uh, Charlie Hebdo happened. It was a physical lynching, physical killing. But yes. these people did online killing. So if they can yes. go on an online killing, then yes. it's better to reject that ideology, reject that uh-huh. belief system. Yes. So in fact, that they did cool. uh, more damage here. Really? Yeah, that was that was stirred up by our friends at Atheist Republic, who came up with sexy Kali image, and and they're quite famous for blasphemous images. They they like to uh, promote images that annoy people who believe in a particular god. Usually, the the uh, Muslim god, the you know. And, and 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 this also shows. I mean. you know believe it or not but the you know you were saying some hindu suggested they were symbolic i have mm. seen hindus who suggest they are not symbolic they are our ancestors yeah. there oh, are right. also many hindus like that literally yeah. you believe that these right. are our ancestor and yes uh, we know one thing is for sure kali is imaginary yes. okay and yes. armin nawabis mother is real okay oh all right yes so what hindus oh. were thinking is uh you insulted some imaginary image of a goddess yes we will target your real mother uh, they are equating two different things totally yes that actually got my mind and i was like i mean i mean this is all bullshit be, yeah you <laughs> you don't want to be part of that do you certainly not no <laughs> so you know that that's what that's very important thing to keep in mind there yes. are imaginary and there are also like real stuff Yes, and we yes. need to keep in that in mind. They cannot be equated. You know, in mathematics, we have imaginary number and real number. <laughs> yes, yes, you do. Right? Yes. But does yes. that mean <laughs> uh, imaginary number is uh, all uh, equal or everything fine? No, but they are used in different way. So, yes, right. I mean, yes. to react to that cartoon, I think uh, what uh, they did was more of an online thing, online yes, killing yes. of Armin Nawabi. To be honest, I would say. Yes. Was But had he really been in India physically, probably they would have killed him. Who knows? Yes, had yes, he been in him. India, he's very wise to stay where he is. Yes, yes. Well, of course, um, pi is an irrational number, but that doesn't stop it from being very useful for calculating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, I'm, know, I wanted to know. I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring this show to an end fairly soon because 
we, we yeah. only do an hour, you know, and it's coming up to the end of that time. But I want you to know, I want to ask whether you know of somebody called Narendra Nayak, who... Yeah, I know, I know. He's a school teacher uh, who yeah. emphasizes scientific temperament and uh, yes. he yes. was attacked by the mob as well. Yes. A Hindu yes, mob and many of them for yes. uh, going against their orthodox way of belief. Again, this orthodoxy belief... Most Hindus, I would presume, have a very a certain image of God. Okay, if Ram is there, Ram is supposed to be like this. Mm. Krishna is there, Krishna is supposed to be like this. Mm. Goddess Kali is supposed to be like this. I mean, most men, I mean, even if you look at Armina, we post closely, it were more often than not the men who were reacting rather than the women. Mm. More men were reacting to it than the men. That's what I observed. Right. Uh, my, one of my observations. So yeah. it also tells me that it is patriarchal, but at the same time, most Hindus already have a certain image of each god, how they gods are supposed to be, or what they are supposed to do already, yeah. and that cannot be, and that and it cannot cross that boundary or that line. If it crosses, then I mean, you saw what happened. Yes, that's right. It's so that, that, that sort of image is there in most Hindu public mind. Dogmatic, bigoted people think that they've got the right to to kill others because they disagree with them. Well, Narendra, he he goes, or he used to, I think he's coming up to retirement now, but yeah, he yeah. used to go out to the villages and teach the yeah. school children yeah. to think critically, which, That's you know, true. It, it definitely needs to be done. But he was then threatened, and for a while he had to have police protection, I think. Yeah, and even he learned some martial arts in order for his own protection. Did he? Yes. Mm. Yeah, he had to learn and he learned, but yeah, that, that's what. So, you know, who says the atheists are safe in India? I mean, uh, in India, it's the thing is like, you can be atheist, but you cannot uh, publicly talk about it or publicly uh, um, go out and speak or, or uh, even yeah. preach about it or even say, think yes. critically. Be critical of your religion, be critical of your gods, or be yes. even critical of your guru uh, thing. One of the biggest problems of maintaining the Hindu institution is, the why Hindu institutions work so well is because uh, belief towards guru, guru is a superior to, you know, god, or even goddesses. So that yes. is the sixth point I forgot to mention, keep that as sixth point. Teacher, yes. guru. Superiority Correct. of guru over gods. Right. That yes. is superior. That, that's interesting because in the Christian world, the gurus, the priest layer of people who are supposed to be God's representatives on earth, they're sort of yeah. they are self-appointed pretty much because they applied for the job and did or didn't get qualified, but whatever, they are in that role. And they have a sort of uh, not a top position in the hierarchy because they've got this this guy up here who is allegedly a, <laughs> above them now in, in in what you've just been saying it's the other way around the gurus are the top dogs yeah so that is the reason why we have a shloka called as guru brahma guru devo mm. uh, guru vishnu guru devo maheshwara guru yeah. sakshat parabrahma tasme yeah. shi guru mema but means yes. a guru is even superior to gods like Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. Right. Interesting. Well, I, I so see that is that. Uh, one reason why the institutions are held. So this is one big thing, and I think it's more it's easier to be critical of gods rather than being critical of gurus. It's important to be critical of gurus. Gurus yes. have to be disowned. Actually, that's right. the whole point. Yeah, they have you to reject the system of guru thinking. Um, yes. This is what a sort of thinking. They That's need to, to be rejected. They have to be exposed as being frauds. Yes. Yeah. Well, this is this has been a fantastic, interesting conversation, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and and thank you very much for coming, and thank yeah. you to to the audience so who will be watching it as a podcast because as I said, it's not going to be. Uh, a live show today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, next week, I've got a very interesting guest. I'm, I'm wondering if I can remember who he is. <laughs> I know I've got a very interesting guest who is I coming. I think Haris, you to, uh, Haris Sultan used to come to your channel long back. 
He did, yes. I had, back, yeah. I had Harris Sultan as a guest a long time ago now. I've done so many shows, you know. It's over 100, <laughs> and I, I lose track. <laughs> so there you yeah. go. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for coming, and I'm, I'm going to wish you the best and uh, yeah, yeah, hope, yeah. hope to bump into you sometime in the near future. Take care. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Bye-bye. Yeah,